Ratcheting up the rhetoric against Iran, the newly appointed U.S. Secretary of State says the Iranians are a threat and urges more sanctions. But what kind of threat is Iran to the U.S. and the region? And can Iranian influence be contained? This is Inside Story. Hello there and welcome to Inside Story. I'm Laura Kyle. The newly installed US Secretary of State has wrapped up his three-country tour of the Middle East in Jordan, where he met the Foreign Minister and King Abdullah. Mike Pompeo underscored the importance of the Jordanian role in helping solve conflicts in neighbouring countries. In particular, he urged Palestinian leaders to re-engage in talks with Israel. And America's top diplomat urged a united front against what the White House says is the regional threat posed by Iran a message he emphasized earlier in both Saudi Arabia and Israel. Harry Fawcett has more from West Jerusalem. In the Middle East, Mike Pompeo doubled down on the theme that has dominated his first international trip as Secretary of State, Iran's threat to the region and the world, and the solidifying U.S. threat to pull out of the Iran nuclear deal. Iran destabilizes this entire region. It supports proxy militias and terrorist groups. It arms it is an arms dealer to the Houthi rebels in Yemen, and Iran conducts cyber hacking campaigns. And it supports the murderous Assad regime as well. Pompeo's arrival in Riyadh followed a barrage of eight ballistic missiles fired into Saudi territory by Houthi fighters in Yemen. The U.S. and Saudi Arabia say such missiles come from Iran. Well, we also think that Iran should be dealt with by imposing further sanctions for its violations of international laws relating to ballistic missiles. Iranian missiles are a chief concern of Israel's Prime Minister, Benjamin Netanyahu. His focus on the risk of their being fired from Iranian bases in Syria and by Hezbollah from Lebanon. With his talk of a U.S. pullout from the Iran deal and new sanctions against Tehran, Pompeo's language was almost interchangeable with Netanyahu's. We remain deeply concerned about Iran's dangerous escalation of threats to Israel and the region, and Iran's ambition to dominate the Middle East remains. If people thought that Iran's aggression would be moderated uh, as a result of signing the deal, the opposite has happened. And Iran is trying to gobble up one country after the other. Both men welcomed the U.S. embassy move from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, scheduled for the 14th of May, the day the Israeli state was declared 70 years ago. Pompeo maintained that final boundaries within Jerusalem were up for negotiation, that the U.S. was committed to a lasting peace between Israel and the Palestinians. There was no mention, though, of the recent demonstrations along the Gaza border fence, where Israeli snipers have shot unarmed protesters, killing dozens and injuring hundreds. Mike Pompeo is a different proposition from his predecessor, Rex Tillerson, who spent most of his tenure as Secretary of State in a state of, at best, semi-detachment from the White House. Pompeo is seen as very close to President Trump, in particular on the issue of Iran, and so that gives his words extra weight. Even, perhaps especially, when they mirror one of Tillerson's frequent messages that Saudi Arabia's blockade on Qatar should end. I also stress to the Foreign Minister that Gulf unity is necessary. We need to achieve it. A report in the New York Times said the message away from the cameras was more direct. Enough is enough. Stop the blockade. By the time Pompeo moved on to Jordan, his chief aim seemed established, laying the groundwork for tougher action against Iran. Clear too of the obstacles, the EU, Russia and China have all warned against scrapping the nuclear deal. The decision will be Donald Trump's. The deadline, May the 12th. Harry Fawcett, Al Jazeera, West Jerusalem. Well, the countdown is on to May 12th, and it appears even Trump's closest aides don't know which way he'll go. U.S. National Security Advisor John Bolton, who's no fan of the Iran nuclear agreement, told Fox News on Sunday that Trump has made no decision on the nuclear deal whether to stay in or get out. OK, well, let's bring in our guests now. And joining us here in Doha, Juan Cole, a visiting professor at the Center for Gulf Studies at Qatar University. From Tehran, Mohamed Morandi, head of the North American Studies graduate program at the University of Tehran. 
and from Beirut via Skype, Joseph Kachichian, Middle East analyst and senior fellow at the King Faisal Center for Islamic Studies. A very warm welcome to all of you. Mohammed, first of all, let's get an idea of Iran's reaction to this very clear message that we're hearing from Pompeo, that Iran destabilizes the region, that it's the main threat and needs to be contained. Well, I think the Iranians would respond by saying that uh, the Israeli regime is subjugating the Palestinians. It is uh, murdering people on the border of Gaza. And uh, the Saudis, on the other hand, and the Israelis are constantly uh, bombing Syria against international law. And the Saudis, they kidnap prime ministers, they invade countries like Yemen, they uh, invade Bahrain and keep the dictator in power. They commit, bring about a, they brought about a siege against Qatar, and uh, they've spread extremism to Syria and Iraq, and of course they've succeeded in antagonizing Turkey. So uh, I don't think that the Americans really are in much of a position to talk about Iran's behavior in this region. Iran has helped. Uh, Iran has very good relations with Iraq, which the Americans brought to power, and it's ele an elected government, and Iran has prevented ISIS and Al-Qaeda and their affiliates, those groups that the United States and its allies allowed to enter Syria. Iran's helped to prevent them from taking the country. And uh, it's the United States that's helping the Saudis to strangle the Yemeni people. So the, 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 the Iranians really don't think the Americans have much to complain about. Okay. Uh, one, what do you think about that? Do you think that's um, uh, something that the U.S., some in the U.S. at least might agree with? I mean, I'm trying to get to the bottom of why this administration fears Iranian hegemony so much. Well, I don't think that Iran bulks large in President Trump's own imagination. I think he uh, wants to undo virtually everything that uh, Barack Obama did and that his uh, targeting of the 2015 nuclear accord is, is actually somewhat irrational and not connected to other policy. Uh, and then with regard to Syria, uh, he's talked about getting U.S. troops out. He's talked about letting Russia take care of Syria, basically giving it into Russian hands as, as a sphere of influence. He must surely know uh, that the Russian aerospace forces and military forces in Syria are closely allied with Iran and Iranian allies. So um, if you look at Mr. Trump's positions, uh, there's no clarity there. Mm. Uh, but the people around him, uh, Secretary of Defense uh, James Mattis and now uh, new Secretary of State uh, Mike Pompeo, are longtime Iranophobes. And so I, I see somewhat of a division inside uh, the cabinet. I mean, this is about more, though, isn't it, Juan, of, of, than getting rid of the deal? We'll get onto the deal more a little later. But it's just part of this approach that this administration is taking to the region. I mean, it's trying to contain Iran's influence wholesale. Well, all American governments have tried to contain Iran since 1979. There's nothing very much new about that. Uh, but uh, there are uh, hawks and, uh, and moderates within the... Uh, within the uh, Washington uh, establishment. And Trump it, it really on foreign affairs ha has been on more on the diffident or moderate side uh, himself. But for some reason, he has brought uh, Iran hawks into uh, his, his inner circle. And uh, people like James Mattis uh, and Pompeo even don't agree with each other. For instance, Mattis uh, has made a press to keep the United States involved in the Yemen war according to the New York Times, according to State Department leaks, uh, Pompeo pressured the Saudis to bring that war to a quick conclusion because it's not succeeding and it's a, a, a foreign relations and public policy disaster. Joseph, does Iran really need to be contained? Well, well usually uh, where there is uh, smoke, there is also fire. And Iran is a major power in the region. No one denies mm. that. But since 19... 79 uh, has a revolutionary government that has made no secret about wanting to export its revolution throughout the Arab world and throughout the Muslim world. In fact, if you just listen to Iranian officials speak, uh, they're doing quite well in terms of increasing their influence throughout the Arab world. Several Iranian officials have laid claim to the fact that they now control four Arab capitals and more down the line, perhaps. 
uh, that uh, that they would like to liberate Mecca and Medina from usurpers, the Al Saud, presumably, uh, and that they, uh, more than anyone else, are entitled to spread the goodwill of the Iranian revolution as they see it, of course. Uh, not everybody agrees with this kind of interpretation. People do perceive Iran to be a real, genuine threat, not in terms of its religion, but in terms of its ideology and in terms of its message throughout the Arab and Muslim world. And I think the facts on the ground speak for themselves beyond what the Americans or the Russians or the British or just about anybody else on the planet wants to do uh, for them. I think that the reality is that today there is a schism in the in the region uh, between Iran on the one hand and its proxies and the conservative Arab Gulf monarchies in which I will also include Qatar, notwithstanding the temporary problem that exists right now, mm -hmm. uh, because ideologically there are very profound differences between the two sides. Uh, Mohammed, I can see you smiling there. I mean, while you may not agree with, with everything that Joseph says, I mean, there is no doubt, is there, that Iran does have, uh, it, it reaches very far throughout the region into many countries, Lebanon, Palestine, Yemen, Iraq. Well, uh, first of all, no Iranian leader has said that Iran controls any capitals. And that is just a fabrication. And I assume that you're guessing Beirut doesn't uh, understand Persian, otherwise he would know better. Uh, I would refrain from listening to al Arabiya and Saudi propaganda and look at the texts themselves before making or passing judgment. Uh, Iran does have a great deal of influence, but Germany has influence in France. Britain has influence in Germany. Iran's relationship with Iraq is uh, with a government that has been democratically elected and ironically the Americans themselves overthrew Saddam Hussein. In Lebanon, too, the uh, Iranian allies in that country, they have seats in parliament, and they are members of the cabinet. In Yemen, ironically, Saudi Arabia did more than anyone else to push the people of Yemen and Iran closer to each other. Before the Saudis initiated this ridiculous and disgusting and disturbing war against the people of Yemen, there was no strong relationship between Iran and Yemen, but now that's changed dramatically. And just a couple of days ago, when hundreds of thousands of people in Yemen were participating in the funeral of their leader, and the Saudis bombed the, the rally right beside it, and no one moved. And it shows how resilient the people of Yemen are against Saudi Arabia. These people do not have, if you look at the footage of their battles, they fight in their slippers. They do not, they're not well armed, and the Saudis have hundreds of billions of dollars of weapons from the United States and the French and the British and the Canadians who are all, they all are uh, guilty of war crimes in Yemen okay. alongside the Saudis. You say they're not but well they failed armed, completely. but let's not forget. So the problem is, is that the, the Saudis, that they side, Iran does they don't side with the people. Iran weapons in Yemen as well to the Houthi rebels. It's incomparable to what the other side does. It's nothing if we assume that it's exactly what the Americans say even though I don't believe they export missiles. Okay, Juan, well, what's your, your opinion on that? The threat that Iran poses? Well, the, the uh, so-called threat of Iran in uh, the uh, Middle East is uh, uh, vastly hyped. Uh, I mean, talking about Iran dominating or controlling these countries is frankly bizarre. Uh, Lebanon has a, 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 a Saudi a dual national as its prime minister. It has a slight uh, majority coalition on the cabinet favoring Hezbollah and therefore maybe Iran. But that includes uh, Christians who are allied on that side. In Syria, uh, the, the, the uh, secular socialist uh, kind of semi-Stalinist Ba'ath party is in power. It uh, doesn't sound very much like uh, Ayatollahs and Shiism. And in, in, in Yemen, uh, there are rural uh, Zaydis who uh, are, are only distantly connected to the Shiism of Iran, uh, and they have mounted an indigenous uh, 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 fighting force, which, by the way, is uh, well-armed, but mainly with American weapons that were given to it by the faction of the Yemeni army from its depots uh, that supported it. So the, the idea of Iran as dominating these places is, is bizarre. It, it, Iran has uh, alliances uh, of convenience, uh, 
and uh, it's, uh, it's supporting, as I said, a secular regime in Syria in the same way that Saudi Arabia supports a secular regime in Egypt, despite both of these countries being uh, devoted to political Islam. But the Washington uh, is, is going, and, and, and Tel Aviv, of course, uh, uh, and, and now Riyadh are, are going to be doing a lot of this kind of propaganda. It, it, mm. it doesn't uh, stand up to analysis. Okay. So if let's, let's move on then, Kachichian, if we just take it as propaganda that doesn't stand up to analysis, as Juan said. How does Saudi, how does Israel, how does perhaps even the U.S. see Iran being kept in better check? I mean, what moves would these countries like to see against Tehran? Well, I mean, uh, I know it's propaganda, it's bizarre. Everything that I say is always propaganda and bizarre, and, I'm, and I have no uh, capabilities to analyze anything. Thanks very much. But Iran has received international backing through this agreement that was signed in 2015 mm. that allows it to essentially, down the line, within a matter of a decade or so, to acquire nuclear weapons and the fact that they've been allowed to enrich uranium is a major concession. This is a real threat to the region. Iran is a major power, as I have said at the beginning. It is not a minor country that can be dismissed. It is not being dismissed. It is being taken very seriously. Therefore, its ideology is very important. And no other person than Ayatollah Ruhollah Khomeini the founder of the Iranian Revolution in 1979, essentially castigated the dice, if you would like, and, and uh, talk, uh, spoke against all of the monarchies of the region as being illegitimate. This is not me. This is Ayatollah Khomeini saying that. Now, of course, uh, with the agreement that is in place now, all of the countries in the region, led by Saudi Arabia, have got to take measures into their own hands because the agreement is a reality. We will wait and see whether President Trump and his administration will uh, introduce mm. changes, walk away from the deal. I don't know what's going to happen on May 12th, but the agreement is there for the time being. And all the countries of the region, including Saudi Arabia, must take it into consideration. And I am very confident in saying that if Iran pursues its nuclear program and its aggressive policies throughout the region, make no mistake that Saudi Arabia will also embark down the line to acquire its own nuclear capabilities in the future. Right. This is not good for the region. Okay, Joseph, let me just ask you then, is, is the region, is the world at large safer without any nuclear deal in Iran? No question about that. I think that we are seeing denuclearization being uh, adopted just about every uh, where where this uh, situation arises, including in uh, on the Korean Peninsula between North and South. There is a genuine effort to denuclearize the, the Korean Peninsula. A few years ago, we all recall that Libya and South Africa gave up, South Africa gave up their nuclear weapons as well. And there are lots of other countries that were contemplating acquiring nuclear weapons, but walked away from it. There is no need for Iran to have a nuclear capability, except except in one case, that is to protect the fragile revolution of 1979 that we are seeing is creating all kinds of problems in the country. Iran is a, is a huge society. It's a dynamic society. Right. But it has its own internal problems as well. So therefore, the nuclear capability helps the regime in Tehran to maintain itself okay. in power. Mohammed, this deal, let's look at it a little bit more. It's, it's under threat from um, the Trump administration. Is Tehran at all willing to renegotiate any part of it? No, definitely not. Uh, the, the Iranians have um, they've made many sacrifices to get to the deal. Many people in Iran were opposed to the deal. And uh, they were, now many of them are telling the government, I told, we told you so. So the government made many sacrifices. And, uh, but uh, both sides, whether those who opposed or those who supported the deal, once the, uh, the state, the government, decided to sign up to the agreement, they all agreed that, one, that Iran, since we've made a commitment, we will stick to it. And Iran has been abiding by the agreement from day one. In fact, they, the Iranians have done more than what they were even supposed to do in order to create a better environment for, uh, for decreasing tensions. 
And, but on the other hand, the Americans, even under Obama, they began violating the agreement, especially Articles 26 to 29, from almost the beginning. Not only they, did they pass the Iran Sanctions Act, which Kerry promised uh, Foreign Minister Zarif not to do, uh, they, promised, they passed the visa restriction laws, and the Treasury, not only did they add individuals and companies to the sanctions list, but more importantly, behind closed doors, they threatened major banks, insurance companies, and others not to do business with Iran. And under Trump, it got even worse. So many in Iran are saying that we're not benefiting from the agreement. And as we speak, I cannot send you a single dollar to your bank account or euro mm. or pound, and you cannot do the same either. So many are saying, well, if we exit the agreement, we don't lose too much. And uh, right now, the, the situation with Russia is much better, especially with the relations with, between the United States and Russia. The, the talk of trade war with China, all of these are pushing Iran okay. and uh, Russia and China closer to each other. So Iran has options today that it didn't have before. But just in response to what your guest in Beirut was saying, all that he said doesn't make sense when you listen to what Pompeo just said when he went to the Senate. And he said to the Foreign Relations Committee that before the nuclear deal, Iran was not actively pursuing a nuclear weapon. And he was saying this to justify that if the United States exits the agreement, Iran is not going to develop a nuclear weapon because they weren't doing so beforehand. Right. So basically what Pompeo did unwittingly is that he destroyed and demolished 15 years of anti-Iranian propaganda because that's what the Americans have been saying for 15 years, that Iran is trying to build a nuclear weapon. Okay. But here he says, as the head of the CIA, that this wasn't the case. Right, Juan, given that Iran appears to have these options, these other alternatives, seems to be happy to walk away from the deal. Is the US really willing to risk it just so that it can see Iran being weakened in the region? Well, I think what everybody has to remember is that it's a seven nation deal. Mm. Uh, it's the UN Security Council plus Germany as a kind of representative of the European Union. Uh, and so you could argue it's, it's a, a 36 nation deal. Uh, if, if one nation, the United States, pulls out, that's, it's not clear that the deal can't survive. And what the deal did was to lift international UN Security Council imposed sanctions on Iran, uh, boycotts of its economy, uh, and um, it, did not, uh, it did not lift the American sanctions in toto, as your guest in Tehran said. Uh, but that, uh, that was the reason for which the Iranians made the deal. They want French and uh, Russian and Chinese and Italian and other investment and trade, uh, which they can now have. And there's no prospect of that necessarily drying up because Mr. Trump, in a fit of peak, withdraws from the agreement. Now, the United States uh, uh, Department of the Treasury uh, can impose uh, sanctions on third parties, on European and Chinese and other firms. Mm -hmm who do business with both the United States and Iran if they feel that they're uh, violating U.S. sanctions. And so it, it, it is a, a stumbling block, uh, but it wouldn't necessarily destroy the deal. OK. Joseph, just in the minute we've got left in these shifting geopolitics of this region, what is the extent that Saudi and Israel are now on the same page? Not just Saudi Arabia and Israel, but Saudi Arabia and most of the world, in fact, uh, I think that geopolitically speaking, the region is going through a dramatic transformation. You have now a very serious escalation of the conflict with Iran, Turkey and Russia essentially uh, reaching all kinds of new agreements and uh, Saudi Arabia, the Gulf countries in general with Egypt, still a pivotal country in the Arab world uh, and uh, in uh, uh, coordination with Israel, in coordination with the United States and major powers on the other side. And I think that geopolitically speaking, uh, what we are seeing now is a dramatic transformation. Mm. A few people are willing to really accept the status quo. Lots of changes are taking place. Uh, we should not expect these changes to occur overnight. And the deal might survive. I, have, I, I okay. don't know whether it will survive or not. But we will certainly be finding out in the coming weeks and uh, indeed months ahead there. Unfortunately, we do have to leave it for today, gentlemen. Thank you all very much for joining us here on Inside Story. Juan Cole, Mohamed Morandi and Joseph Kachichian.
And thank you too for watching. You can see the programme again anytime by visiting our website, that's aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, do go to our Facebook page, that's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Laura Kyle, and the whole team here, it's bye for now.